Well, welcome. Um, again, my name is Andres Mantilla. I am the director of the Department of Neighborhoods. Thank you so much uh, to everybody who joined the call. This is an opportunity um, today to hear uh, from our partners in the mayor's office, um, our partners in King County, um, and um, our, uh, our colleagues with the Seattle Fire Department, as well as OIRA, on the latest of what's happening, not just with um, COVID testing, which I hope we can go into uh, in terms of kind of rates of uh, infections and what we're seeing in Lake City, but with also with some news around vaccinations um, and some data around that and, and with some uh, announcements as also for events. Um, what we'll do is we'll go quickly go through some uh, some information, some presentations. I think some folks are going to share some data uh, via the uh, share function, and then we'll have ample time for questions and answers. Um, that we can, uh, uh, I can facilitate that uh, that part. So I will remind you, um, please uh, try to mute yourself so that we don't have uh, background noise, um, so it's easier to hear. And then, um, uh, if you do want to, when it comes to a question, you can just either raise your hand or unmute yourself as we go through that. So, but I'll I'll cover that in a little bit. I. Um, want to turn it over to uh, Julie Klein from the mayor's office to take us um, through some of the data um, as well as I think uh, she'll do this in partnership with Chief Scoggins who um, is joining us today. So Julie, go ahead. Yes, thank you Andres. I'm Julie Klein from the mayor's office. I'm the mayor's public safety advisor and I've been working on both the city's testing programs in uh, close partnership with the Seattle Fire Department and now working on the vaccination rollout also in partnership with uh, the Seattle Fire Department and some other partners as well. Um, so uh, thrilled to have both Chief Scoggins and then I believe also we have um, Acting Captain Brian Wallace on the line as well, who is Chief Scoggins' sort of um, lead as it pertains to testing and vaccination. So between the three of us, hopefully we can answer a lot of questions that you all have. Um, First and foremost, what I wanted to do was to sort of give everyone an update on where we're at on COVID testing numbers, um, both across the city and then a little bit more focused on the Lake City area um, and the North Seattle area. So um, I'm gonna see if I can pull this up here. I apologize. I think this is going to be the right one here. All right. Can you all see that? Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So um, this is sort of a, a snapshot off of our the city of Seattle's testing dashboard. Um, most people on this call probably are aware, but in case folks are not, the city of Seattle is operating four testing sites, free testing sites across the city in uh, partnership with the, they're operated by the Seattle Fire Department in partnership with University of Washington Laboratory and uh, with, the, with the blessing and help of um, Seattle and King County Public Health as well. Uh, one of those locations, uh, the most uh, relevant to you all is the, the former emissions testing site that's on Aurora Avenue North and about 134th up in North Seattle. Um, that's been operating, I believe, since June of last year. Uh, between that site, uh, the emissions testing site um, that we converted in the Soto neighborhood, and the community hub sites in Rainier Beach and West Seattle, um, we have tested um, over, I believe, 460,000. We've done 460,000 tests in the city of Seattle since we've started, and we have had almost one out of three Seattle residents use one of our testing sites since June. So we are um, so thrilled with how well the Seattle Fire Department has operationalized this. Um, they've done a really great job and um, they have made a huge difference, I think. I think um, the Seattle Fire Department's efforts in this area are part of the reason why the city of Seattle is in general faring much better than a lot of the other big cities across the country. So um, second only, frankly, to uh, San Francisco in 
um, being able to keep our numbers low and the accessibility to testing to our residents um, and keeping our uh, our death rate low as well. So I credit the testing uh, program that the Seattle Fire Department is putting on with a huge part of that. Also, our residents' um, adherence to social distancing and other health orders like mass, wearing masks and washing hands and doing all of that. So um, just to give everyone a, a little snapshot of where we are, our EMS director, our medical um, emergency medical services director um, who works at the fire department, Dr. Sayer, puts together a dashboard with a lot of the information from our testing sites to help us keep track of trends um, and to pay attention to uh, locations where we may see hot spots or concerning areas across the city. This is kind of a dense snapshot here, but this snapshot is from the two weeks um, prior to today. So you can see this is the Seattle results in the last 14 days. In the last 14 days, the city of Seattle at our four testing sites has tested almost 30,000 people. So we've done almost 30,000 tests in just two weeks. Um, and you can see on the right hand side there is a map of Seattle. And it's a, what we call sort of a heat map. And it shows us where we're seeing the most positive COVID results from our testing sites in the city. Um, and there are percentage numbers and those percentage numbers, what they mean are, those are the percentage of tests that were conducted in the city of Seattle test sites that came back positive for COVID. So um, of particular interest, I'm sure to you all, um, as uh, Lake City Denzians would be the um, Lake City area of the map there. You can see that that top end of the lake that sort of also encompasses probably part of Lake Forest Park um, and the city border there is at about a 3.9% positivity rate. And then just below, which was be sort of um, uh, the bottom half of Lake City um, going into Ravenna is at 3.1% positivity rate. So those numbers have all been going down. You can see there's a, a chart and I'll use my pointer. Hopefully po folks can see if I use my pointer a little bit here. There's a chart here um, just to the bottom center, uh, just to the left of the map that sort of shows the, the trend down of positive cases that we're seeing across the city as a whole. So that is good news. Um, I did want to warn folks that there is um, the University of Washington Laboratories um, did recently detect some of the new variants in King County. Um, and we are concerned that with the new variants being more contagious, we may see that number start creeping up again. Uh, but I think everybody can take a lot of pride in um, the mask wearing that they've been doing, the hand washing they've been doing, um, and all of those things that have contributed to that red line continuing to trend down since the beginning of the year. Um, all right. Let me move on to the next page here, which has some more uh, granular information for the North Seattle area, including Lake City. So on the on the left hand side, the blue map, the blue heat map, as we call it, those are the number of tests that have happened in each of these sort of discrete areas of North Seattle in the last month or so. And on the right, the red map or the orange, um, the orangey pink map are the percent positives of those tests that we've had in the last 28 days. So you can see these numbers are a little bit different than the overall last two weeks map that we just looked at. You can see that in the last month, uh, the, the Northeast Seattle area, so that Lake City kind of like running down into Ravenna area and running up a little bit into Lake Forest Park has had a 5.9% positivity rate and a 4.0% positivity rate. So um, what that means is in the last couple of weeks, those numbers have been going down, but it wasn't that long ago that those numbers were pretty high and concerning. So um, just want to give people an idea of that snapshot um, between the number of tests and the percentage positives in there. Um, Chief Scoggins, before I move on, did you want to, um, or, or Captain Wallace, did either of you want to add anything about testing trends or anything like that in the Northeast Seattle area? Uh, hi, Julie. Chief Scoggins. No, I think you covered it unless um, Brian wants to cover some points. I do not. That was very thorough, Julie. OK, thanks. So before I move on and start talking about potential vaccination efforts and things like that, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that there may be 
about um, or Andreas, I'm not sure if you want to save questions to the end. That's fine. But uh, before let's I move, save, topic, let's save it till the end because I think okay. we want to get through some of the announcements as well. Absolutely. OK, um, and I know we have a, um, a friend from Public Health Seattle King County on, so I won't spend too much time on here. But um, as we sort of pivot towards vaccination efforts, um, I did want to note that there are delineated roles here. The city of Seattle, which doesn't normally work in the health space at all, um, is working in partnership with public health and the Department of Health, not only on testing, as we have been for the last uh, several months or half a year almost now, um, but also in the uh, vaccine administration space. And we are, again, um, relying on our wonderful partners at the Seattle Fire Department to help us do a lot of our early days vaccination efforts, as I'm sure you've heard on the phone or on the news, um, the big limiting factor right now is supply of doses from the federal government. So the doses come from the federal government to the State Department of Health, who then distributes it to the different counties. Um, and uh, the city of Seattle is one of the providers in King County. So um, I'm sure that uh, Seattle Public Health, uh, Seattle King County Public Health will give you more information on um, dose scarcity. Um, but what the city of Seattle is doing with our very limited number of doses so far is making sure that we are meeting the needs of the highest risk and most vulnerable populations in the city. We are trying to identify and fill in gaps in the vaccine delivery system. We're leading mobile teams. These are the fire department mobile vaccination teams that are focused on equitable distribution, making sure that we're finding folks who don't have access through the regular health care system or other means of distribution and trying to get vaccines to the most vulnerable among them. And again, we are really focusing our efforts on those who are most vulnerable of getting very sick or dying if they contract COVID. So in the near term, that means folks that are of a certain age. We've been very focused on 75 and older and are now just because we are starting to get enough vaccine, being able to sort of widen that a little bit to focus on folks who are potentially 65 and over as well. Um, in doing this, we're really working with community partners to make sure that we're overcoming barriers to access and addressing a lot of the nervousness that's understandably out there about getting a COVID-19 vaccine. So. During this, we are also prioritizing our high-risk BIPOC communities and immigrant and refugee communities because we are seeing a disproportionate number in those communities that are getting infected with COVID and dying of COVID. And so we are focusing our early efforts um, and will continue to focus efforts on those communities because those are the most at risk of contracting the disease and having the most severe consequences if they do. So the city of Seattle is working to, since we are obviously not usually in the vaccine business, working on partnerships and coordinating with our partners that we identify to both advocate at the state, county, and federal level for resources, including vaccine doses, um, coordinating where we put sites, um, where we do mobile teams, um, where we do pop-ups with our partners to make sure that we're getting a, getting a good spread across the city making sure that we're all sort of speaking in one voice with clear, accessible communications on what the status is, um, how vaccine distribution and administration is going, and any information that they may need. We're working very closely with public health to make sure that we're aligned with public health's messaging and amplifying public health's messaging about um, what it means to be vaccinated with one of the different COVID vaccines that are out there. Um, and then with our partnerships that we're establishing, we are accelerating and growing our mobile reach um, and developing some high volume strategies and high volume strategies more commonly referred to as mass vaccination sites. One of those big places where we can just cycle through and get a bunch of people vaccinated in one day. So um, that being said, um, those mass vaccination sites are limited right now. Um, we are not going to be able to really open those up and become operational until we start to see a significant increase in vaccine dosage coming from the federal government to our area. All right. Um, this is just a quick graph to show you how many people we have to try to vaccinate um, in the greater Seattle area in order to get what they call herd immunity or to get enough people vaccinated that it, um, the impacts of the virus are significantly reduced. 
Experts are saying that's about 70 to 75% of everybody, um, all adults in the greater Seattle area that need to be vaccinated in order for us to get to a place where we can really safely reopen. So for the, for the King County or Seattle metro area, 70% of all adults is 1.26 million people. And obviously that's a lot of people to try to vaccinate in a really short amount of time. So as a result, we are setting up uh, significant increases in capacity across the system in Seattle. And again, like I said, we're working in very close partnership with Public Health Seattle King County that is doing this in other parts of the county in partnership with other cities as well. Um, and we're focusing on, you know, really three main strategies, right? We've got the large scale mass vaccination sites, like something where the city will be likely opening up um, at some point in March. Uh, we've got our mobile teams that are being operated by the Seattle Fire Department and our partners that are working and coordinating with us in that space. Um, and then we have the existing healthcare system and infrastructure that includes the community health clinics, the pharmacies in your neighborhood, and your healthcare providers. Um, all told, we think we're building the infrastructure to be able to do over 30,000 vaccinations a day. Again, the limiting factor being when are we going to start getting enough doses to really reach our full capacity? And that is a bit of a moving target. And I'm sure our friends from uh, public health that are going to um, speak with you next uh, are may have some additional information on that. So um, those are sort of the, the, the data slides there that I wanted to share. Um, Chief Scoggins or um, uh, Captain Wallace, any uh, anything that I missed or anything that you may want to um, add to what I've sort of discussed? I know there's, there's some specific um, information announcements about Lake City um, pop-ups coming up that uh, Joaquin will be doing later, but. Okay. Hi, Julie, Chief Scoggins. No, no additional information from myself. Um, I think. Uh, when you said testing, you mentioned 460,000. I think the number is 640,000. Thank you, Chief. My dyslexia got the best of me there. <laughs> um, thanks, Julie. And before we go to uh, Matias um, from the King County, I just want to emphasize as low, uh, and I know there were some questions around percentages. We'll get to those. We're not going to lose those. Um, I want to emphasize as we go through these per and you see percentages on the screen. And I know this is something that we all share and our, and our partners at King County as well. And Matthias will talk about this and the mayor and the chief and others is that those represent real people. And um, and sometimes when we're looking at statistics, it's 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 we lose sight of that. But we um, we are aware we are keenly aware of the impact that this is having in community. And we're also keenly aware that a lot of your organizations are dealing with this in at a much closer way um, than than when we are we are even able to respond to so you know I know organizations um, in Lake City like uh, Lake City Collective and a bunch of others are really at the forefront of this and where it's going to require that partnership for us to uh, work on this moving forward and so I'll turn it over to Matias uh, from uh, King County Public Health uh, to take us to the next part of it and then we'll go into Joaquin my colleague Joaquin to talk about some of the uh, pop-ups Great. Um, thanks, Andres. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Yes. OK, great. Thank you. And um, thanks for uh, having me here. And uh, I do uh, appreciate, Andres, what you were just saying about the uh, the impact. Uh, this is uh, one year into the pandemic. We actually had the first uh, death in the nation in King County, and we're coming up on that uh, anniversary. And um, it's around the health impacts, but it's also the social, economic, mental health impacts that we are seeing. And uh, it's been a very uh, challenging uh, year for our community. So just wanna um, definitely agree there and, and um, uh, know that the county public health uh, partnering with the uh, city of Seattle is extremely important and also supporting our communities during what continues to be a very challenging uh, time. So I'm gonna, um, uh, not repeat the things that Julie has been saying and just cover some information, um, you know, try to do it quickly too, just to get a, a sense of where we're 
uh, at both in terms of the pandemic itself and then some general um, vaccination uh, information where we're at with the county. So um, really, we we have have had uh, several uh, spikes, which the spring and summer were uh, now pretty minor, and then late November, um, early December, we had what were our biggest uh, spikes um, uh, for the the county, and this was part of a national trend. And it's been very. Um, this number has been going down very significantly um, in recent weeks, and now we're under a uh, 100 cases for every 100,000 uh, people in the county, which is extremely, um, uh, which is low compared to where we were just a few uh, weeks ago. But still, when in, in relative terms, we were early on in the pandemic, we were trying to keep the number under 25. So this is just something to put everything under perspective that the rates that we have, even generally in this country, are extremely high and not where we want to be in terms of uh, transmission. Um, the um, Julie did mention the racial disparities where those continue to be extremely uh, concerning uh, anywhere from two to five times the rates among communities of color. Uh, in terms of uh, Pacific Islander, in Latinx, it's uh, around five, um, and then for other communities, uh, two, two, three, or four times when we talk about the Black uh, and Indigenous uh, community. Um, also, if we see, and the other thing actually that was mentioned was the the variant, and this is where we say we're very concerned um, that we have seen this number come uh, come down. There's some trends in terms of schools, for example, and others starting to reopen, or at least with hybrid models. But as we see the new variants, there are um, a number of different variants now. The one from the UK, the B1117, is um, more transmissible. I'm not necessarily seeing uh, that it's going to be, it's more um, uh, lethal or uh, has a harder health effect, but it's actually, it is much more transmissible, anywhere from 30 to 40 percent more. So we are very concerned that, in fact, if we don't do anything differently, that the numbers are going to um, go up uh, uh, due to due to that. So the the masking the social distancing and physical distancing remain really uh, important and now also we've seen um, the south african uh, variant uh, also in our county so those two have been uh, now uh, found in our county and the south african variant is also um, makes uh, find early findings are that it makes the vaccines the two uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine le uh, reduces the efficacy from 94 to 95 to a low, lower rate. So that's also um, of concern. The other things are just are happening is uh, in, in terms of the um, rep reproductive rate in terms of the pandemic or the transmission, it is um, it is going down. So in, on average, one individual is transmitting it to less than one person. So that's where we want to keep it. And then hospitalization uh, rates and um, and also deaths have been on the decline, so that's all good. And all of this is on our website, so uh, information that you can actually access for yourselves. In terms of, um, we have uh, many different dashboards. This is the dashboard now that we have for vaccine. Um, as you can see here, um, uh, Julie was talking about the 1.26 billion people or adults that we are trying to, in our county, that we're trying to uh, immunize to reach that 70%, because um, that's the focus right now. So if you look at here, you can see actually that we um, have made some very, and this is countywide, so it's not just the city of Seattle, but we made some pretty significant strides that were over uh, 320,000 individuals in the county receiving the first dose and two doses. We already have about 160,000 people um, that have received the dose. So we are uh, pretty significantly uh, along in the trajectory. We, um, what we wanted to do also in terms of this is the vaccine supply that we've been seeing um, that it has become, became in the last uh, weeks, has become more of a challenge. We really want to see this continue to go up. And we had both, um, there's been uh, vaccine supplies, our own weather, and then the national weather and other contributors have really made that we actually had a flat or even a dip. Uh, but what we have been seeing now, too, is that um, even some of the shipments. Uh, now are becoming double shipments, so which is quite good. So we're going to be seeing in coming weeks now a real um, uh, increase in the numbers of doses that we're seeing in the in, in our county. 
Um, there are things that Julie was talking about, the different modalities in which this is being um, delivered. Um, and they're now, uh, federal government has announced that um, also more coming directly to pharmacies, more coming to community health centers as well. So there are um, a number of um, additional places where vaccine are, is going to become increasingly uh, available. In terms of, um, if you look at, we look by, by group, there are two, oh, actually, let me go to demographics. I'm sorry here. If we look at demographics, um, one of the the one A group, the first group that we vaccinated were the healthcare workers. So those are the things that uh, here and a lot of healthcare workers uh, have been vaccinated. But I want to um, put into our attention here by the demographics and by race. We don't see the same level of uh, disparities and equities in vaccination as we had were seeing in terms of COVID uh, infection. Uh, and we've actually made some pretty significant headway and been closing some of the gaps here. So what this basically represents, this is for the 65 and older age group. For the white population, we have, um, we, in terms of who has received one dose, 48% have received uh, one, one dose. For the Asian American, it's 41%. Hispanic Latinx, it's 38%. Uh, black African American, it's, it's about 30%. American Indian, Alaska Native, Native 55%, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, uh, about 57%. There's also some uh, vaccine coming directly to uh, tribes and, and some Indian health services that uh, is really um, uh, helping to increase the numbers uh, there. So uh, I think here we can see um, African American and uh, Black in particular. Uh, and the Latinx uh, community are the ones that are have um, where we need to be as a community, uh, 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 making sure that we reinforce our efforts uh, there, but also continuing in, in some of the other groups as well. Um, and also significantly right now, I said health care providers, which were up here in terms of just um, age groups. Right now we are focusing um, especially in the 75 and older, but the categories that allows in the 1B, uh, one group from the state is the 65 um, and over. So it's both of these groups too. So we can already in the 75 and older, we have vaccinated close to 60% um, of that population with one dose. So that's pretty significant. And we're at 52% um, for 65 and older. So we are, um, uh, even with vaccine challenges, I think we've been making some uh, headway um, that's pretty significant and we are hearing more and more that people who are trying in these age groups trying to get vaccinations uh, are able to um, to get them and I'll just um, probably the last one I'll just show is the maps uh, which you can see um, we we are coming up with new maps this is what we'll show that's 16 and over but this is for 65 and older and 75 and older you can see in the county uh, how we're doing in the north um, Seattle, but also this includes uh, some of the shoreline area as well. Uh, it's about at 58% for those at 65 and older. We're going to be um, producing a, a new um, tool very quickly that's going to have uh, some information or very soon uh, by zip code, and it's going to be um, extremely um, helpful for people to really, and as we do our vaccine planning, as we do uh, community vaccination, uh, events, it's really going to help us uh, uh, really focus uh, our efforts. Um, the last part I'm going to show is also we do have a lot of uh, uh, just general COVID uh, resources and information on where to get tested. Um, uh, similarly, the county has outside of the city has a lot of vaccination sites as well. Um, but when we look at, um, there's a lot of information here to address uh, uh, myths or to address uh, any uh, information that is needed around this, um, face finder, um, other tools. We are trying to work on some systems too that will have, uh, be able to uh, provide call-in services in which somebody will be able to get more complete, uh, know when they qualify, and then be able to eventually even register in one call to be able to do uh, everything right now. We're not necessarily there yet and recognize it's been a little bit of a challenging system for folks. Uh, a lot of information translated in different languages here, and this is the shortcut URL to um, uh, get to the site. So yeah, with that, I think I'm going to try yeah, to yeah. stop presenting. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Matias, and maybe you can type that uh, URL into the chat because um, I do recognize that this is a lot of information and a lot of uh, graphs and 
it might be hard to track for folks on computers, but also on phones and over the phone. So, um, you know, if uh, Matthias, if you don't mind also putting your uh, contact info in there, if folks have follow up questions uh, as well. Um, so you have the data, um, you have the picture of what's going on. We wanted, I wanted to turn it over to um, my colleague Joaquin from uh, the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs to talk a little bit about some of the upcoming plans of what the city is planning to do in partnership with um, a lot of uh, your organizations. Joaquin. Thanks, Andreas. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Joaquin Wee, and I am the External Affairs Manager and Policy Advisor for the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, and so good to see some familiar faces on this call. Um, as Julie mentioned, and as others have mentioned previously, the role of the city in uh, vaccination um, distribution is to really fill the equity gaps. Um, as probably a lot of you have experienced yourself or have heard, when vaccines finally came to Washington State, um, there were people who were um, able to get vaccines or vaccinations through their primary care provider. Other folks were able to get it through um, nearby, maybe neighborhood clinics, but it was very difficult for folks who had to access vaccines online. Um, maybe there's 25 different vaccine providers, which means there's 25 different ways to uh, make an appointment and 25 different online platforms to uh, figure out how to schedule yourself and maybe even 25 different uh, phone numbers. So as probably a lot of you experienced, and I know I experienced that myself when I was trying to um, uh, make an appointment for my mom for her primary care provider to get her vaccination, it was very challenging. Um, and some people did, some people were able to get vaccinations, um, especially when supply increased a bit and uh, hospitals and clinics were able to smooth out some issues with their online platforms. But as probably a lot of us all know, um, getting vaccines is very challenging. And even more so if you're an immigrant who is limited English proficient, or if you're an elder that doesn't have reliable um, online uh, accessibility, or someone who just has a hard time dealing with websites. I know that on even a good day, I have a hard time being on the uh, internet and navigating websites uh, myself. So, so really what we try to do is with our pop-up clinic strategy is um, our office, the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, we have a lot of relationships with various immigrant serving organizations around Seattle. Uh, even some in the greater Seattle area. And as soon as we saw that vaccines were coming to the city, we, and, and uh, I want to preface this by saying I come from a community organizing background. And so part of community organizing is you get on the phones, you call people, you text people, you say, hey, how are you? What's going on? Um, uh, I saw that you're uh, I saw that you're organizing some vaccination clinics and educational opportunities. Do you have reliable access to vaccines? The city of Seattle is now officially a vaccine provider. And so with our 1000 doses a week, which is not very much, we want to do what we can to help BIPOC communities and limited English proficient immigrant and refugee communities. So uh, one of, that's one of the things that our office did is we saw um, which which nonprofits, which community-based organizations that serve immigrants and refugees, which ones were really focused and organizing vaccination education um, presentations or webinars or Zoom calls, which ones were talking about vaccination on their on their social media websites, and I got on the we all, all of us in OIRA we all. Um, put forward this effort to get on the phones and to talk to folks about, you know, what, what are you seeing? Do you think that you might be able to host um, a vaccination clinic or as we're calling it a community vaccination event? And some people call it a pop-up clinic. And this strategy, the community, the community vaccination event strategy, or I'm going to call them CVEs. Um, with CVEs, what, what we do is we, the city, have our mobile vaccination team, and those are our uh, amazing friends at the Seattle Fire Department, because at the very beginning of this pandemic, they came together to deliver uh, PPE to uh, elder care centers, and they also started up 
more mass vac or excuse me mass um, COVID-19 testing sites, the fire department was best equipped to deliver vaccines. Uh, the issue is where are we going to deliver them? And so we talked to our community-based organizational partners and we found that a lot of our friends have offices or churches or partnerships with mosques and uh, are telling us, you know, if you bring the vaccine here and you bring people who can deliver it and a way to schedule people, we have relationships with eligible um, phase 1B tier 1 um, elders. So those are folks who are 65 years of age and older and folks who are 50 years of age and older who live in a multi-generational household, like someone who lives with a grandparent and also a young person, which as a lot of us know, well, a lot of immigrant and refugee neighbors and friends fit under this description. And so they, they told us, we have the relationships, we can probably get on the phone or robocall or text message folks and get them to show up at our place. And we even have an opportunity to talk to our friends and neighbors about why it's important to get the vaccine, just in case they encounter folks who may be vaccine hesitant um, or maybe reluctant to get a vaccination. Um, if we can get you 100 or 200 people scheduled, can you bring 100 or 200 vaccinations to our location? And um, we said, absolutely, we can get started on that strategy. So this pop-up strategy or community vaccination event strategy is one that we started uh, launching. Our one of our one of our first was with the Ethiopian community of Seattle. They had actually, it's an interesting story. I got an email from them. It was a you know e-blast, and it talked about wanting to do. Um, an educational forum in Amharic to their community about vaccinations. And I thought, well, if Ethiopian community of Seattle is already on top of this, maybe they're ready to do a pop-up clinic or a, or a community vaccination event. So I called up Sophia, who's the executive director, and she said, actually, we have a Swedish is already um, organizing a community vaccination event with us, but we have over 150 people on our waiting list. And of course, these people are all um, folks who would have difficulties accessing the vaccine from a primary care provider. Many are limited English proficient, many don't have access to the internet or maybe just have their cell phones. So um, we said, okay, let's organize a, a, a community vaccination event in your parking lot. They're on Rainier, um, very much close to the, to the Rainier Beach neighborhood in the valley. And um, we set it all up. We did a site visit, got everyone scheduled. They used their own scheduling um, procedures to track people. And we were that day able to vaccinate over 200 uh, additional East African immigrants who would have had uh, issues vac getting vaccinations otherwise. And so we saw that the, you know, this type of partnership works. We saw how effective it is. And, um, you know, it was also an opportunity for Sophia to talk to people and talk people into getting the vaccine. So this is the strategy we plan on doing um, across Seattle. And uh, the only thing that has hampered our ability to move fast on this, and as people have mentioned before, and I don't mean to add to the chorus of broken records, but it really is about supply. Without supply, it's really difficult for us to really move forward and to um, organize all of the community vaccination events that we want to do. We really would have wanted to come into North Seattle sooner, but with limited vaccine supply and with the um, huge, severe winter weather that happened across the country that also prevented us from receiving all of our supply. Uh, recently, it was really difficult for us to 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 do that. And so now I'm I'm happy to announce that we are. Um, oh, actually, before I get into that, one other thing that's important to know about these uh, these community vaccination events, which I already kind of hinted at, was that they're appointment only. They're not uh, generally open to the public. Uh, the CBOs we work with, the community-based organizations, they have relationships with um, community members who are elders and um, they know their community best. So they're the ones bringing folks to these events, signing people up for the time slots and making sure that people get there and also making sure that people make it to their second dose appointment, which we've ahead of time already um, organized with that, with that CBO.
Um, and so um, with that, I'm happy to announce that one of our first pop-up clinics in the North End is with Lake City Collective and also with um, Trinity Church, which is some of you may know it as Eritrean uh, Kadisti Selassie. And um, it's in the neighborhood that's like in between Northgate and by Lake City. And um, there is, as a lot of us here know, uh, fellow North Enders, a growing immigrant <clears throat> refugee community in the North End. And so we're thrilled to be able to, uh, to start the, one of the first pop-ups, which won't be the last. We hope to continue on with more partnerships, especially for uh, API groups and uh, North End by 145th. Um, there's a growing Korean community that we are also uh, discussing a pop up there uh, or community vaccination event. And it's something that we are excited to continue as we move forward with receiving more vaccine supply. Um, I'm going to put my information into the chat. If you know of other uh, immigrant and refugee serving organizations around Seattle, uh, I'd be I'd be happy to chat with folks to talk more about the opportunities of scheduling a CVE community vaccination event. And um, thanks so much for this opportunity. Oh, Andreas, I think you're on mute. Or not Hello. sure. Could, oh, there you are. I can hear you yeah, now. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Joaquin, um, and thank you for your partnership and, um, and and your team. I also wanted to call out um, that we have um, from Department of Neighborhoods, um, some, uh, Malia Brooks, who's been coordinating uh, our, our uh, work as well with in partnership with Joaquin and others, and as well as Carrie Brazil, um, who have been just really great partners in being able to kind of navigate this. Um, before we go to questions, because I know there might be a lot, um, I also wanted to bring back Julie, because I think, Julie, um, there was maybe a conversation prior around additional COVID-19 testing sites or, or testing booths in Lake City. And so you wanted to just speak to kind of the interest there and um, the opportunity for partnership. Absolutely. So thanks, Andreas, and um, for, for keeping me um, on track on all the things that I wanted to talk about. But um, so we have um, the city of Seattle has, as I mentioned, four Seattle Fire Department operated testing sites. We also have a number of um, uh, curative kiosks around the city that do COVID testing. So those are not operated or run by the city of Seattle, but they are run by a private company called Curative who does most of the testing in LA and LA County. And they have several kiosks around the city. We have one at Seattle Center. We have one at the Convention Center. Um, we have one in Mount Baker. Uh, we have one in West Seattle. Um, and we have one at, at the Lower Woodland Park. Um, and one at the Northgate Community Center. We um, have access to setting up additional kiosks. If there is interest of um, in trying to place a COVID testing kiosk in the Lake City neighborhood, we would love to do that. Um, and there are some, some just parameters. Um, they take up about an eight by eight um, space, uh, which is about two parking spaces or a, or a parking space and a half. And um, they need um, access to electricity, just a single regular three prong plug. Um, and, and we need to place them in a location that has um, some parking capabilities for folks, somewhere between 20 and at least 20 parking spots for folks um, uh, who come to use the kiosks. And it would also be great if they were in locations that were um, uh, really accessible for transit. Um, and folks who may want to walk up to the testing kiosks. So um, those are sort of the parameters. We are um, happy to speak to um, any private business owners that may have space on their property. Um, we've kind of looked at trying to place them at some of the locations in city property, and for various reasons, um, th they don't look like they're going to be great fits. Um, but we would love to have this conversation with uh, folks in the Lake City area if there's interest in having a kiosk in your neighborhood. There's about 40 people. Um, there's about 40 people in the chat. So if some folks have put uh, questions in the chat, and if you're able to do that, that's probably the best way for us to kind of make sure that we hear from everybody. Although if you do want to raise your little hand or somehow indicate that you will have a question, I'm going to try to just kind of work through this. So please be patient. 
um, um, with me. And then uh, DON team, if you can help kind of flag for me as well. Um, people Are you ready for up. some questions, Andres? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Osvaldo. So I see one from Kelly. Um, Kelly asks, have you been working with Seattle Housing Authority and other low-income um, housing providers? I'm going to let Joaquin answer that one because he knows <laughs> all the details. Yeah, so the strategy with Seattle Housing Authority is that because Seattle Housing Authority already has homes and facilities where people uh, live and congregate and play and, and work, um, we actually came to them. So the Seattle Fire Department mobile vaccination teams uh, traveled to various Seattle Housing Authority homes and vaccinated folks. And it was very early on in January when we were doing this. And I don't know if, if we were just having a bad day, but we thought, oh man, I hope that people want to get vaccinated. We just, it was one of our first projects and we just weren't sure if people were were going to to want to show up. And we, we got vaccination rates in the high 90s. People were really excited to see us. Uh, it was no problems at all to talk people into getting vaccinated. And it really showed that if you come to where people are, um, and you and they see each other getting vaccinated and they're able to talk about the issues right then and there, um, you're going to see high increasing rates of vaccination. So it, it just showed that it worked. And so that model, which is a slightly different model than the pop-up model, uh, is one where we've used for adult family homes and for permanent supportive housing units. And so it's not just uh, Shaw and Mihai, but it's also DESC, um, Downtown Emergency Service Center, um, and other uh, affordable housing providers. I think Bellwether was another one. So again, it, it's it's all about going into communities to to do this work. And uh, Seattle Fire Department has just been so experienced in doing this already with testing and delivering PPE and and even in in some cases uh, um, other other needed basic need supplies to people in need. So shout out to Seattle Fire Department. I know you're on this call. Thanks, Joaquin. I'll read a couple comments and then move on to a question. Somebody said, Jen said, Lake City seems like a smart location. Uh, look, a kayak kiosk at Garfield as well. There's an empty Lake City Community Center. Uh, the car dealerships are helping brewing or the Fred Meyer there. But then uh, I want to go to one of the hands up that I saw first from Jude. Jude, did you type in? I don't see your question. So can you uh, unmute and share your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Um, Hello? Yes? Okay. Um, first, I'm actually feeling kind of sick. I just got my second shot today, and all of a sudden, I feel like I want to throw up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I hope that's not going to happen. Um, okay, I'm the president of Lake City House, which is a Seattle Housing Authority building, and we have two buildings um, side by side. Um, Lake City Court, speak 17 different languages so we have um the seattle housing authority did a testing in the courtyard of lake city court because it's pretty open air and everything um so that's a possibility there the um and we have a lot of seniors in lake city house and disabled people and so forth I got really lucky early on. At first, I tried to traverse your, um, I say your system for getting an appointment, and it was a nightmare. But I got I got on with Fred Meyer, which is like two blocks away. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, the biggest problem is lack of internet for you know infrastructure. Um, and a very confusing bunch of providers of shots. Everybody has their own system. Um, and we did tell the city we have a clinic that is empty above the food bank, a uh, North End Food Bank. Um, Kelly and Dean, um, uh, Ms. Juarez is executive director, um, he told me he let the city know about the clinic and it it's only a couple of blocks away from the lake city fire department um so this is like as far as i'm concerned that's a huge thing um for helping with vaccinations 
Um, so please, um, by the way, mm-hmm. um, I just wanted to mention everybody put their last name first. So it's kind of hard for me to know what your first name is when all I see is an initial. I just thought I mentioned that not trying to be yeah. mean. Oh, that's um, the, the, the standard city of Seattle uh, uh, <laughs> um, thing that pops up on teams. Apologies for that, Jude. Okay. I just don't know all your names. Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. Uh, what did I want to tell you? Um, okay. I definitely wanted to tell you about our clinic. Please utilize it um, because poor people don't have cars um, and we're poor people. <laughs> <laughs> and we're disabled, you know, and I'm not going to get on a bus for nothing. Um, no way. I'm not risking that. Um, also, um, the gentleman that was talking about the variants, um, when you mentioned the South African variant, is that the one that's more deadly? I mean, as far as um, because now you say both variants are in Seattle. I just wondered, I mean, I know they're both more contagious, but is the South African one more, uh, is it worse? Matthias, you want to just talk yeah, about great, that? Yeah, great question. It's actually, um, there's an important distinction. The the one that I was saying from the UK, the, or uh, the British one, is the mm-hmm. one that is more transmissible, so more, more easily spread. And the one with, um, so we're not talking necessarily as these being uh, more uh, deadly or more likely to lead hospitalizations or deaths. The one from South Africa is not necessarily, it's a variant that now doesn't make it necessarily um, a, a good match or the best match for the vaccine. So it makes the vaccine f- efficacy go down from what is uh, usually 94, 95% to um, a, a less uh, effective um, percentage. Thank you, Matias. Let's move on to the next question. I'll take one from the chat and then we'll go back to uh, a hand raised. A couple other comments, senior, seems senior housing would be great. Um, Joaquin, maybe for you, how do those without computer access uh, get registered for pop-up sites? Uh, the, so our, from our experience, the community-based organizations who are doing the recruiting are calling people. Uh, some sites are doing robocalls, other sites are just going through their Excel documents and, and calling and calling and calling. Other ones are using texts. So if you're connected to a nonprofit uh, up in the North End, it is likely that um, that they'll be getting a hold of you. And uh, thankfully, uh, Cesar, who's with Lake City Collective, he just put into the chat uh, a way for folks to uh, he has a number there um, as well as a, an email and if you can't see that I can at least read out the phone number um, or I'll just read I'll just read the whole chat so Lake City Collective has been reaching out to different um, Lake City Collective organizations who have uh, BIPOC clients and North Seattle and live in North Seattle in general if you know of somebody from the BIPOC, BIPOC community black indigenous and people of color who is 65 plus or 50 plus like grandparents living with grandkids um, please have them call 206-208-9899. That's 206-208-9899. Leave a message. Uh, please leave your name, phone number, age, language. You can also email community at lakecitycollective.org. That's community at lakecitycollective.org. Um, this will, again, good reminder, Cesar, this is not the, going to be the first community vaccination event or pop-up clinic. Things will get better, supply will increase, and we'll have more of these events um, as we continue through this year. Thank you, Joaquin. Our hand raised is Sanjay M. Can you unmute to ask your question? Yeah, actually, you asked my question for me. That was my question. But my follow up to that question is uh, we have, com- I live in the community, there are community members who don't speak English, and they may not even be, I'll say, undocumented families. So they're not on any registry. How do those folks register? Well, one of the things that I found for folks who are undocumented is that the uh, and, and having friends who are undocumented, the undocumented community is 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 not one that lives in the shadows 
it's robust, folks are connected with each other, they um, develop their own support networks amongst each other, and they are connected to folks like Lake City Collective. I know down here at the South End, there's amazing work by this organization called Wysen. Actually, Wysen is citywide, statewide, Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network. And so there are people who are spreading the words amongst these informal networks. And really, as someone who's uh, a Filipino gossip myself, Gossip is one of those things that not only makes our immigrant worlds go round, but also is the probably most effective way of getting the word out about not just who's getting a divorce around the town, but also what is important information is out there that we need to know. So um, I, I trust that Lake City Collective and um, other organizations in the North End are tuned into those networks. They could be WhatsApp accounts, they could be um, phone banks or phone trees. But I, I have faith that they're going to do that important work to get the word out to, to folks who may not be connected to more um, mainstream organizations. And uh, Osvaldo and Joaquin, I'll just add that um, this is one of the uh, reasons, and I think Cesar and you mentioned Trinity as well, um, connected through churches as well, and, um, and we're, you know, undocumented uh, folks and communities really congregate churches, you know, mosques, temples, et cetera. And that's one of the areas that we uh, used in South Seattle when Rainier Beach recently to recruit um, and, and turn out a lot of um, a lot of participants, especially for those that are what we call vaccine hesitant, uh, that maybe won't even hear from a government or even an organization, but might hear from a religious kind of connection uh, about the importance of getting vaccinated. Sorry, Oswaldo, well, go ahead. I was just going to read the the um, the next question, but I have a lot of comments from people that are saying uh, North, the North Helpline. They have a clinic space above the food bank uh, available for you know for vaccinations. People said that the um, the helpline North Helpline is in the same block as the Lake City Court and Lake City House. Um, so there's there's that for for people who are on the call. Let's go on to another hand raise and I'll pick on Linda Musselman. Do you have, can you unmute please? Yes, um, I'm Linda Musselman. I live at Lake City House along with Jude Ewing. Ewing. Um, and I do applaud the city of Seattle and the city fire department. Uh, they did a great vaccination job in like 10 buildings of Seattle Housing Authority, senior housing authority buildings. Um, they did there, nearly 700 residents, and that was wonderful. But we have a lot of elderly in this building and elderly that are from different countries. Some speak a little English and don't at all. Um, so I'm very concerned about them getting a vaccination. Thank you. You're you're bringing up an, uh, a really important point around language access um, in, in this whole uh, in this whole um, uh, process. And Joaquin, I know you can speak to I think a little bit more of the organizations that we're working with. But even within, and Julie maybe or or um, or uh, Brian or Chief can talk a little bit about how language access is being addressed at the sites themselves in terms of testing. Uh, Joaquin, do you want to kick us off there? Yeah, one of the, again, more praise to heap upon Seattle Fire Department. So Seattle Fire, Fire Department has and has been trained up on this uh, tool called Language Line Solutions. And Language Line offers over the phone interpretation. So if uh, I'm at a place and I need to talk to someone, I could call Language Line and then I could put the put the phone on speaker and that person can listen back and forth and interpret. And also if you have a tablet or a phone with a camera, the language line also has an option where someone actually could appear on the screen and can see all the people talking because, you know, sometimes or actually not sometimes, but really verbal communication is mostly nonverbal. And so it's really helpful for the language line interpreter on the phone to look back and forth and see how people are talking and, and what people are saying. And that's been a really helpful tool in a pinch to help bridge the language divide between, say, the fire, fire uh, department mobile vaccination team and folks who are on site. And one of the other things we're finding is that the um, organizations that we're working with to recruit people, because they know the people that they're recruiting, 
And because those folks are often more comfortable with them and they trust and know them, um, they'll often bring people to the site and meet folks there and act as interpreters. Um, we're not asking that every site do that, but we're just really glad when a site is able to do that. Um, and it's been, in terms of our experience, it's been every, it's been all over the map from Amharic to traditional Chinese to Spanish. Um, since there are a ton of languages uh, represented in Seattle, uh, we try to make sure that those languages are also represented in the work that we do as a city. Can I have the number for that uh, contact? Can I have the number for that yeah, contact sure. it's information? It's 206-208-9899. Uh, okay. 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 Okay.
98125, 98125 largely there, which is really, um, you know, uh, tonight's focus on, on Lake City, but parts of 98133, uh, parts of 98105, uh, parts of over near Ballard, I lose track of the zip codes, and the Aurora Corridor. And so really looking underneath the hood, if you will, is really, really important to be able to sort of reach people. And it is also, it's really hard because I, um, do some client facing stuff as I'm sure uh, service providers on this call do as well. But you know, a, a 75 year old person who is BIPOC, um, who says that she can't go, she doesn't know how she would possibly get to Cantor Auburn for a shot. And so I just think we need to, I'm sort of a call out for, please remember um, that we are a big part of this region. And I um, and I understand the, the tension about really equitable distribution. So I've, enough of my plea. Um, I uh, And then also really, I love the idea of going where people are. I love using community-based organizations in places where there are already relationships. And I think we're going to need to have a mix of different kinds of sites. Um, so whether those are CHCs, uh, but also something that's a little closer to a mass site. Um, and so um, thank you for this evening. And I have said my two bits. Um, uh, and I, I, I am eager for the supply to increase. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Hathleen, for being here tonight and for that uh, comment and your questions. Um, a couple, we can go over a few more questions on the side. Thanks, Jack, uh, mentioning that uh, might be uh, Hellbend Brewing could offer space and parking lot for pop-up vaccination. Um, Jen says something, could you really use the location in, locations in other languages? Uh, Joaquin, I'm sure, is taking note of that. And I mean, everyone in the city involved in this efforts we're, we're being very conscious with the multilingual, you know, uh, language access options for this. And then there's a question from Sanjay. Is there an estimated timeline for Seattle School District employees to receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Can anyone answer that question? I think maybe Matthias, just to, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I can answer that. So that's still not yet in, within the categories that are prioritized, but it's later on in the 1B. So the first one that's going to be prioritized are essential workers over 50. And next, it's going to be those with uh, individuals with underlying health conditions. And then the next one, which is 1B tier 4, are the essential workers under 50 years of age. So um, probably that first group, essential workers uh, over 50, where the draft plan shows that uh, teachers and staff from schools will be part of that. Um, they will be the first group to be uh, have access to vaccination. We still, I showed the vaccination um, rates and how we are doing. So we are still um, probably a couple of weeks away from moving into still the next um, kind of priority phases. So it's still going to be some time. But when we open up, at least the older, those over 50 years of age will be able to get vaccinated. Thank you, Matias. And Cesar did post a link to the, the, the state's uh, faces for the vaccination. I don't see any yeah. other questions on here. And Thank you, Osvaldo, for helping, uh, for moderating that um, very, uh, in a much better way than I would have been able to. I want to turn it over uh, back to uh, Julie from the mayor's office to maybe offer some closing words. And just before I do that, reminder that this is uh, recorded um, and we are going to be doing translation of this uh, and then it will be posted um, throughout uh, social media and uh, on our on our neighborhood blog as well. So as well as Osvaldo will send it out to the listserv as well. So Julie, um, do you want to offer any additional or closing thoughts? Absolutely. Thank you, Andres. And I, I would also invite Chief Scoggins if he has any um, closing thoughts as well or, or Captain Wallace. Um, uh, but did just want to address a couple of the um, concerns. Kathleen, we hear you. We are absolutely um, working on fixed sites in North Seattle, a couple of different ones. And so once supply shakes loose, they're they're gonna happen, I promise. Um, and being a North Ender, I, I I feel the pain of sometimes feeling like we're we're overlooked. We just have one precinct and we just have, you know, 
But um, rest assured, we are working on plans for North Seattle fixed sites. And as soon as supply um, shakes loose, they will be there. Um, we are, um, you know, partnering with a lot of the existing healthcare infrastructure, um, including University of Washington, and coordinating with them on mobile teams as well. And uh, we've had a, a good success. It sounds like you you uh, you absolutely are aware of the the SHA visits and things like that that we've done in North Seattle. So. Um, Rest assured, we are going where the data um, sends us, and that includes um, a lot of North Seattle um, zip codes and areas. So um, with that being said, um, Chief Scoggins, I don't know if you have any any closing words, but um, uh, the mayor's office, as usual, thanks, OIRA, thanks, Dawn, and, and special thanks to Seattle Fire Department for, this has truly been like a, a, a real combined uh, city department effort uh, to get these vaccinations rolling out and they are still ramping up. Um, and so with that, Chief Scoggins, anything um, or Captain Wallace, if, if Chief Scoggins had to drop off, I'm not sure, but any closing words? Sure, well, just a couple of thank you. Um, Andreas, thank you to you and your team for putting this community meeting together. Thank you to the uh, members of the community for for coming out, weighing in, expressing your thoughts. And we, we are always excited and to hear from the community, it means a lot. You know, our team's really working hard to continue to serve community. We know this has been a very challenging time for everyone, but we're gonna continue to look for solutions to try to reach community where they are to continue to serve them. And I'll leave it there and pass it to uh, Brian Wallace. Yeah, I just also wanted to echo some of the thanks that Chief Scoggins and Julie have offered to our partners in OIRA and Department of Neighborhood, Joaquin, uh, Malia, Andres, the work that all of you are doing to get the community in front of us with our community partners is huge. We're getting a lot of credit for this, but we're just bringing the vaccine and you guys are doing a, an enormous amount of work to get people in front of us and the most vulnerable ones. So uh, I want everyone to be proud of their city team that's doing this work. Thank you. Andres, um, Cesar has his hand up. Yeah, and before we go there, I just want to, um, one other note is um, we do recognize that, um, you know, there are has it, what we call has vaccine, vaccine hesitant community members. And so in partnership with um, OIRA, DON is working on some education uh, webinars that we can announce shortly once we have the details, as well as um, other community conversations. So as we kind of get into the pop up and the details of that, we want to make sure that we continue this conversation. And then, as Julie mentioned, as we look at more mass sites, potentially, you know, coming back um, with some more details. But Cesar, um, go ahead if you want to offer a few words. Yes, uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, we just we couldn't close this uh, meeting with with you know Lake City Collective and also speaking on behalf of Segai Berge from the Eritrean uh, Kidisti Selassie Church. Uh, you know, we couldn't close without also, also thank, saying thanks to uh, to the city, uh, to the different departments, and also for the all, all the organizations who are here today. And uh, we are, of course, uh, you know, working already very hard. We actually started ma a, a make building a list of uh, eligible people uh, some time ago, and kind of getting ready for the time we, you know when we will have the opportunity to have this pop up clinic. Uh, we, you know, we got this uh, very nice surprise. It's not gonna, it's not an easy fit because, as it was mentioned, there is people in our communities who do not want to get vaccinated. Uh, uh, if we even had people in our list already, and and some of them they they changed their mind already. Uh, so so it's it's about you know a lot. If this this pop up clinic is not only a one day event. It's 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 an event that has been happening. You know, before we we got the announcement, and also uh, throughout the time and uh, until that day, uh, we really, uh, really, really uh, uh, think think of you as a partners, uh, because uh, many of your organizations have people who can who can get the, the vaccination this time, uh, and all the information will be uh, kept private and confidential, and it will be destroyed. It will not be used for any other reason besides this vaccination. Once it the, the, the Seattle Fire Department gets access to that information that they need, so that's the end of that information. So rest assured that all, uh, with your clients that this information will be will will not be shared or used. And also, we are working on having interpretation during that day. Uh, we if we can provide you know as many as many as nine languages, 
uh, we relied a lot on on conversations uh, uh, a, a lot of the of the art that we do is 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 about you know making connections and and uh, so uh, so so that's also takes time so uh, so uh, please uh, refer people to us uh, we will be uh, we, we we will be doing our best to 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 take this opportunity and we don't take it for granted because we have been waiting for this for a long long time we have been seeing people in our communities Latinos especially who have now they have been sick almost like two times. So we have we are seeing a lot of people getting sick. We have we are getting people calling people calling us from the hospital, sick, trying to see what they they can we, we can do for them. So this is really really a great opportunity for our community in general in North Seattle and Lake City especially. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar, for sharing. Well, and and I want to do a couple more uh, shout outs and then close us for the evening. Uh, thank you to Cesar from Lake City Collective for also, um, you know, bringing folks to the meeting. Uh, Chris Everson from Build Lake City Together, who's here, and the folks that came from from that community group as well. I know that there's uh, other organizations in Lake City that are participating here, and the list I could spend the remainder of the time listing them. But uh, thank you for those that contributed to bringing uh, folks here today. I thought it went really well, and I'm sure this is not to be. It's not going to be the last time that we do this so keep an eye out for future community invites and we're also planning to make a change and switch uh, uh, the way that we host a meeting from teams to another more accessible um, technology that folks can use to call in instead of just having to use an app or a computer but thanks for everyone for being here the city folks um, and that's the end of the meeting thank you so much uh, i put my email on the sidebar if, it, uh, if any of you want to be added to a contact list that i run for the north end of the city which is the area that I represent north of I uh, north of the ship canal. Please reach out to me. I'm happy to put you on that list. Have a good night, everyone, and take care and stay healthy. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Andreas, can you put that email address in there again for the contact to be added to the list? I'm sorry, I'm holding you up, but I couldn't find it. This is Sanjay. <laughs> sorry, which one are you talking about? Um, Osvaldo? I'm looking for the it's gentleman that was just talking, yeah. closing the call out. He said yeah. he put the email address in there, and I wanted to get that. Yeah, let me let me put it in right now. Thank you. Oh, what's going on? Hold on, technical sure, difficulties. Sure, sure. Let me, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll no, do it. it's it's working now. Oh, got it. There it is. You see it? Ah, uh, perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for coordinating all this. This is great. All right. Thanks, Sanjay. Take care. Yep. You too. Um, Patty, are you um gonna stop recording here? Um. Osvaldo started it, I can't stop. So I think we just need to leave. Okay. Thanks.